Welcome to the Megacast, our live daily TV, radio, and streaming show talking about all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keith. Today we'll be talking to a number of people about topics of interest and importance to Oakland County residents and Michiganders just like you. Let's begin with what's making headlines on our local news page on civiccentertv.com. Our top story comes from Rose White at MLive. Over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, many Michiganders, including here in Oakland County, applied for unemployment with mounting issues causing delays and a mass of errors. But prior to COVID-19, these sorts of issues were nothing strange to the unemployment insurance agency or Michiganders applying for those benefits with many of those Michiganders wrongfully being accused of committing fraud in their rightful claims for unemployment benefits from the state of Michigan between 2013 and 2015. That's not to say that fraud did not happen, but not at the scale that those who applied were accused of committing it. And if you were in the category of the wrongfully accused, your chance at a settlement is soon to come to a close. The deadline is rapidly approaching with registration forms due on April 5th and a claim form due shortly after that on April 15th. Uh, you are uh, encouraged to apply if you are wrongfully if you have wrongfully been considered fraudulent by the state agency in, in terms of your previous applications and just a correction the claim form is April 14th not April 15th as I had said uh, it is marked in this article it's April 14th so the correct information is on our local news page I misspoke and said the 15th it is the 14th so uh, I digress you are encouraged to apply if you were wrongfully considered fraudulent by the state agency and, and state attorney general Dana Nessel said quote while this settlement cannot undo the hardships that these residents faced it does secure the long overdue relief that they deserve and close to quote. You can fill out your registration forms and your claim forms online at UIAclassaction.com. Again, the website UIAclassaction.com. It's claimed that upwards of 40,000 Michiganders may qualify for this class, class action settlement. If you are granted a payment, you can expect to receive those funds by, by August 19th or September 8th of this year. Also making headlines and finally making headlines today on our local news page on civiccentertv.com from the team at the Detroit Free Press. It's getting warmer here in Michigan and it's going to be pretty warm throughout much of this week, giving us a preview into some of those warmer times of the year as we get into April and as we venture on into the summer months. And it's a time of the year where camping enthusiasts may soon be able to engage in this beloved Michigan pastime for free. The Michigan Department of Natural Resources, or the DNR, will be giving people like you a chance to camp free of charge at a variety of state parks and recreation areas for upwards of a month at a time. But it's not entirely for free. You'll be put to work on hosting and caretaking duties to maintain these sites and help guide visitors to these landmarks and beloved Michigan destinations. You can get in on the action right now with applications open year-round for, for sites all across the Great Lakes State. Here's what you'll need in order to qualify. You've got to be at least 18 years old or older, have some camping experience, and you'll be expected to bring your own, some of your own equipment, food, and other supplies and items. You should also be willing to work five days per week, and you'll have to pass a background check. And most important of all in this is arguably having a positive attitude and being eager to help Michiganders and visitors to these sites all throughout the state of Michigan. The work will be some fun mixed with some manual labor as well, fixing lights, managing visitors and greeting them as they enter these parks, program setup and presentation of historical materials at uh, regular business hours throughout these sites as well as cleaning and other activities all for the chance to be able to go on these great locations all across the state of Michigan. Spend your time there all for free. You won't have to pay any of the uh, camping charges, the camping site fees, the uh, park entrance fees, all of that will be covered by the DNR in exchange for doing some of this volunteer labor that really helps them out, especially with, you know, they're, they're not immune like any other business or any other organization at this time to some of the staffing issues that have been had all across the U.S., including here in the state of Michigan. And so this is a great way to allow people to engage with these parks that really love camping and being in the great outdoors in Michigan during the great warm months of the year that we have here in Michigan from around this time of the year through uh, the through just a little bit after Labor Day and in, into parts of the fall and it's always nice to be outdoors in the state of Michigan in these great parks and you'll have opportunities at many different places all across the, the state of Michigan Aloha State Park in Sheboygan Hayes State Park and Onstead are a couple of, of those Hartwick uh, Hartwick Pines State Park 
in Grayling or some of those that are listed in this article, as well as a link to, op to uh, applications from the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. So if you're interested in some of these free camping opportunities that you can go and, and apply for these opportunities with the DNR right in that article, and it explains more about you know, when those applications are going to be due for the upcoming season, some of the duties you may undergo as you're working uh, through this, po this program and, and uh, are doing some of that work out in these parks, and a lot of more information all in that article. It's on our website, civiccentertv.com on our local news page. And hey, what a great way to spend some time outdoors and have some fun. Look, you can get these opportunities for upwards of a month, but there wasn't any indication that it has to be any set period of time. So you know, maybe you wanna go up for a weekend, to go for, spend a week in the campsite, do a lot of these activities, meet a lot of people visiting Michigan or uh, just, just visiting different parts of the state that they live in and engaging in these parks, meet some people, spend some time in the great outdoors, have a little fun, and yeah, it'll put you to work for a little bit, but it's outdoor work, it's beautification work, it's all the things that make these parks here in Michigan so great and allow you an opportunity to do all of this for free. Really interesting opportunity here. Great article from the Detroit Free Press and their and their news team explaining what this program is and how you can engage in it yourself and with your your family get upwards of a month for free in these warmer months of the year operating at these campsites and being able to have a camping opportunity, a little bit of a work and a volunteer opportunity and helping a lot of people enjoy Michigan's great outdoors. CivicCenterTV.com on our local news page for that article and all of our headlines today and throughout the week as well as COVID-19 updates and other public health updates from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services as well as the Oakland County Health Division. We have a great show ahead on today's edition of the Megacast. Coming up next, we'll have our weekly mental health segment with Carrie Kravick from the Birmingham Maple Clinic. Stay tuned. This is the Megacast. Let's savor these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. My Michigan TV is streaming everywhere on Apple TV, Roku, Fire TV, and more smart TV apps. My Michigan TV is on your phone too. Take us with you wherever you go. Just search for My Michigan TV on your favorite app store or visit mymitv.com. All Michigan, streaming everywhere. My Michigan TV. Hello, nose. My nose knows is when somebody uses the bathroom. Mom, all I did is flush. Ooh, I smell cookies. I smell an A+. Plus. How could my nose be running when it stays on my face? Our noses know if those sniffles are just a cold, allergies, or COVID-19. So swab it, test it, it's good to know. Let's relish these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the festivals going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Welcome back to the Megacast, our live daily TV, radio, and streaming show talking about all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keeft. You can learn more about our program and stay up to date with us on civiccentertv.com slash megacast, where you'll find information on all of our partnering stations across the Great Lakes State, including our co-flagship, My Michigan TV. Learn more about stations in your local area right here in Oakland County. And of course, find all of our full shows and each individual segment on demand. CivicCenterTV.com slash megacast is the place to go for all of that. This week, we will recognize World Bipolar Day to bring the world population information about bipolar disorders and 
educate to eliminate the social stigma surrounding the illness. Joining us now to discuss bipolar disorders is Carrie Craywick, a therapist at the Birmingham Maple Clinic for our weekly mental health segment. Carrie, thanks for being with us. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Yeah, glad to have you on as we are, are right around that time of the year where we are recognizing World Bipolar Day to bring some awareness to bipolar disorders. And much like many other uh, mental health or, or cognitive disorders, there are a variety of different ways that bipolar manifests in people. So let's just start from the baseline and explain what is bipolar, what are bipolar disorders? Bipolar disorders are a chunk of similar disorders that are all part of mood disorders, which mood disorders include depression. So where bipolar disorders differ from depression is that in addition to depressed episodes, they also include what's called um, a manic or hypomanic, which just means sort of a less severe version of manic episode as well. And, and so who does this typically affect? Does it affect people uh, at an earlier age or, or at an older age? Uh, what, 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 sort of demo, what are the, dem the demographics on this? I think that the age, the most common age of diagnosis happens to be right about the mid 20s, like about 25 years old. And typically we see um, the symptoms associated with um, bipolar disorders between 18 and 29. Um, there are cases now where people believe they're seeing them in younger um, in younger children, but um, all of that research has not yet evolved. And that's got to make it a little bit more of a challenge to address these issues and really fine tune where among the different definitions of bipolar disorders someone may be affected because in some cases, cases with men in particular, we know around 25 years old is the time where their brains, where the frontal lobes have uh, fully ma matured. And, and so that's the point where you're really seeing that development, if not come to an end, be near its point where it's as far as it's developed. And that's where these problems that they have manifested or if they are taking full effect can really have a major impact on their life. So typically, where does that diagnostic process start in terms of bipolar disorders? You're absolutely right. Bipolar disorders are of the hardest to diagnose for one reason being that people when they are depressed are more likely to seek treatment when they are in a manic or hypomanic um, stage. They may feel elated, have high energy, seem very goal directed and therefore no, not really suffering. Um, so sometimes it's often misdiagnosed as depression um, because without seeing someone's full medical history, the presence of um, those manic or hypomanic episodes are not fully understood even even by the patient themselves um, also um, like you said of course there's the science is incomplete on what might cause bipolar disorder certainly genetics and brain uh, function do play a role and in, um, in family history as well so although if you have a family member with bipolar it's not a guarantee you would have it if you have a parent or a first degree sibling um, those are those are things that would increase your likelihood and according to the National Institute of Mental Health, about 2.8% of U.S. adults had bipolar disorders in the past year, and about 4.4% of American adults will experience a bipolar disorder at some time in their life. And because there are such varying forms of bipolar disorders and, and therefore varying forms of treatment, uh, how effective are those treatments in, uh, if not you know, eliminating some of these symptoms, but you know, uh, uh, taming some of these symptoms that can often be severe, but in some cases may just be benign and, and, and uh, re recurring. Sure, I think, um, you know, in just uh kind of pop culture jargon, we use the term bipolar so often and so often inaccurately, it's really created a misunderstanding about what truly bipolar is. Bipolar is a very serious mental health diagnosis that can have very severe consequences um, and does need to be taken seriously. And, and medication is um, usually always involved, although there are different medications that treat different symptoms. Some medications treat the depressive episode, whereas others um, treat the manic episode. Episodes. And for some people, a depressive medicine can actually um, initiate their first manic episode because it's taken their mood too far to the other direction. Um, so these things need to be done very closely with a trained psychiatrist. And, and it really is sort of a trial and error for each individual patient to see which medications are helping their symptoms.
as best as possible. Um, certainly talk therapy can help people, especially just to cope with um, their own issues with their behavior in one episode or the other, or how they're treated by friends and family and to sort of, you know, come to a good place in their own esteem about who they are as a person and 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 what are their symptoms. Um, and also just executing the self care and coping um, necessary to also predict and plan for episodes as they arise. Uh, March 30th is World Bipolar Day and joining us to talk about bipolar disorders is Carrie Krawick from the Birmingham Maple Clinic for our weekly mental health segment. And uh, Carrie, in terms of treatment, go going back to treatment and diagnosis for, for <clears throat> mental health professionals like yourself or others in the profession like psychiatrists that would be on more of the diagnostic side, neurologists on more of the diagnostic side, what are some of those behavioral factors or physiological factors that are being watched out for as, as adults particularly are approaching that age around that you know, 18 to 29 range as you mentioned earlier where bipolar disorders are typically diagnosed? So like I said, people mostly enter into treatment when they're in a depressed episode and actually bipolar patients tend to have more depressed episodes than manic episodes or hypomanic episodes anyways. So again, it seems like they're spending more of their sort of symptomatic part of their life as depressed. So of course, with any depression, we're looking at feelings of hopelessness and worthlessness, fatigue, um, extreme guilt, um, low self-esteem, uh, poor body image, um, thoughts of suicide or self-harm, um, you know, difficulties, falling asleep, staying asleep or oversleeping, um, under eating and overeating. So um, any of those things that just where a person is in a state of, you know, like hopelessness and despair. BirminghamMaple.com is the place to go for information on getting in contact with Carrie and the professionals at the Birmingham Maple Clinic. You can also give them a call, 248-646-6659, 248 646-6659 for more information. And you mentioned some of the different ways that a bipolar disorder can affect someone. You mentioned the, uh, that the depressive or the, low, the lows are, are typically more common uh, in terms of those mood swings than the, the manic or hypomanic episodes that may be associated with a bipolar disorder. But that being said, regardless of which way the pendulum uh, proverbially may be swinging, bipolar disorders can be lethal for those that are affected, especially if they're on the more severe side. So now, how, how does that factor into the, really the importance of getting in front of this issue as early as possible and finding that right treatment for that right person and their specific case? Sure. Um, like I said, on the sort of extremely manic side, more than just elevated mood and energy, you may see people engaging in high risk or dangerous behaviors. Um, you may see um, people experimenting with substances or, again, other things that they wouldn't ordinarily, um, uh, having a extreme sleepness or insomnia, maybe even having some psychosis or, um, you know, delusions or that are changing their sort of perception of their reality and what's around them. Um, so, yeah, all of those things have the potential to be very dangerous. Um, and, and, and it's with the support of family, too, and other people to maybe, you know, instigate this as more than just, you know, a lot of energy or a really good mood. We're joined by Carrie Krawick, a therapist at the Birmingham Maple Clinic for our weekly mental health segment on the Megacast. You can find all these segments on demand on our website, civiccentertv.com slash megacast. And you can also learn more information and get in contact with the Birmingham Maple Clinic at their website, birminghammaple.com, or ask them some questions. Info at birminghammaple.com is their email address. Uh, Carrie, uh, as we think about uh, World Bipolar Day coming up uh, on March 30th, and, uh, and the, the point of a day like this is to eliminate some of the stigma, to learn more information, and have a better understanding of something that is complicated, like bipolar disorders, and like any other stigma, whether it's surrounding race, or gender, or sexuality, or, or other mental health factors that can often be judged by the general population. Understanding sort of that day to day, those experiences is a really important element of eliminating that stigma. So in terms of the day to day for, bipolar, for those that are affected by bipolar disorders, what can that look like both on the more benign side, not, not to minimize those symptoms, uh, but also on the more severe side, given that it is in, in, typically characterized by mood swings? 
you know, um, like I said, mostly they're just like us. They're people just like us. They're talented and successful and have wonderful jobs. Um, there are many documented people um, that are that are famous. And so, I mean, they're really, their days are just like us. But I mean, I think with the added of maintaining some consistency and medication, some self-care, tracking, you know, what are sort of the things, what are the signs and symptoms that they notice as perhaps the mood is changing um, and just being aware and informed about how to take care of themselves it would be like any any chronic health issue whether it was something like diabetes or something like that where um, you just have to stay on top of it and the better care you take care of yourself and and the, the sort of awareness and support you get from your family is always going to be helpful to you you know it can be challenging especially in some of those younger adult or later adolescent years to have a family member with bipolar um, but, you know, as families, you know, trying to monitor giving a person their their independence and their autonomy without being too overly intrusive or controlling, which can exacerbate symptoms or um, without also being too sort of hostile or critical, which can exacerbate symptoms as well. So trying to be useful and helpful without without overstepping. And, and not not to encourage any sort of self-diagnostic behaviors that can often just lead to bunch of anxiety, but for individuals really having that inventory of their mental health and the way that they're feeling on a day-to-day -day basis, on a regular basis over the course of weeks or months or even years can be really important for getting out in front of some of these mental health issues, whether it is a bipolar disorder or some other issue that may that may pop up or may have been present for a long time. So for those that you know may be doing that inventory at this time of the year or at other parts of of the year of their life, what sort of symptoms should they be looking out for? What sort of behaviors, if they're doing their reflecting, should they be maybe listing down and thinking, okay, this might be something that could indicate maybe I need to go in and, and talk to a professional and see if there is something diagnostic going on here so that if, you know, for example, they are affected by a bipolar disorder, they can get out in front of that because as you said, that treatment, that consistency, uh, with that treatment is so important for them to be able to live a regular and, and healthy and enjoyable daily life. Sure, just like we said before, of course, the period, the the presence of anything concerning like thoughts of self harm or suicide, anytime where um, your symptoms seem to be disrupting your life, you know, if they're interfering with um, hygiene, eating, sleeping, if it's interfering with personal relationships or work, certainly if there's some sort of like core features of your life that can't be maintained while you're symptomatic, would absolutely be a sign to get some treatment. More information and ways to get in contact with Carrie and the other professionals at the Birmingham Maple Clinic can be found at BirminghamMaple.com or by calling them 248-646-6659. You can also join Carrie Craywick and I each and every week for a mental health segment here on the Megacast and find us on demand, CivicCenterTV.com slash Megacast. Again, April, uh, March 30th is World Bipolar Day as we recognize the, the symptoms and the different ways that bipolar disorders can manifest in people and, and it manifests equally between men and women, the average age of onset being about 25 years old. And according to the National Institute of Mental Health, uh, over the course of a lifetime, 4.4% of American adults will experience bipolar disorder in some way or another uh, personally. So Carrie, a couple more minutes with you before we'll need to move on uh, for today. Anything else that we haven't discussed about bipolar disorders that would be important to keep in consideration at this time, especially as we recognize World Bipolar Day on March 30th? I think, like I had mentioned earlier, bipolar, perhaps more than any other mental illness, is one that we use and throw around as kind of maybe even derogatory to ourselves or our peers. Oh, that person is so bipolar. Um, we're using it inaccurately, and you don't know, like you said, with so, such commonplace, um, whom you may be hurting by describing somebody else that way, um, that it's not just a change in, in mood or behavior where someone goes from a seemingly good mood and a bad mood across the course of one dinner. These are these are mood symptoms that are um, bigger and may last days or weeks um, and can be very debilitating. And so it's not just that kind of fluctuation if we know a person whose personality seems to go from hot to cold. It's not really the same thing. And when we use the word bipolar to describe that, um, perhaps we're hurting that person, but we may also be hurting someone who's actually diagnosed and or muddying the waters so that 
it's not clear when to seek treatment. Am I just going because my personality and, you know, changes, you know, dramatically from one minute to the next or, or am I dealing with something serious here? All comes down to a little bit of kindness as we recognize these different forms of mental health issues that may pop up in all of our lives and, and we may not be aware of on a day-to-day -day basis. Carrie, thank you so much for joining us and explaining more about bipolar disorders and the way, a number of different ways it manifests in our communities. Thank you for having me. More information, ways to get in contact with Carrie and the team at the Birmingham Maple Clinic can be found on BirminghamMaple.com. Let's take a quick break. On the other side, we'll go from the comfy confines of the therapist's office to the excitement and of the arts and explore our recent discussion with Hetty Blatt from Oakland School. Stay with us. This is the MegaCast. There are many different kinds of noses. Our noses can sniff out all kinds of things. Good things bad things. Your nose knows if those sniffles are just a cold, allergies, or COVID-19. So swab it. Test it. It's good to know. Welcome back to the MegaCast, our live daily TV, radio, and streaming show, talking about all things Oakland County and the state of Michigan. I'm Tyler Keeft. You can learn more about our program and keep up to date with us anytime and all the time at civiccentertv.com slash MegaCast. Great resources there for you all across our local communities, including links to community television and radio stations in your local area, whether you're looking for some hyper-local student content from our friends at 88.1 The Biff that join us on the radio live every day throughout the week from 10 a.m. to 11 for our live shows or uh, other stations such as the Media Network of Waterford or live to tape in the Birmingham Bloomfield area on Birmingham Area Municipal Access and in Northern Oakland County with Orion Neighborhood Television. You can learn more about all their original programming and follow what's going on in your community at civiccentertv.com slash megacast. And of course, if you can't join us live at 10 a.m. each and every day throughout your work week, you can always join us online on demand after work over the weekend in the evenings at two o'clock in the morning whenever you so choose to watch the megacast we thank you for joining us on civiccentertv.com slash megacast joining us now on the program is the fine arts consultant with oakland schools hetty blatt uh, is joining us now to talk about all the different programs and different ways that our local intermediate school district supports the arts in your individual school district in your local community hetty thanks for being with us with us Oh, thanks so much for having me. Glad to have you on to talk about this because the fine arts are such a critical part of education for kids. And, and, and unfortunately, you know, throughout time, we, we tend to see that it's something that goes away. One of the first things in, in tough times and it's something that people really seek in, in good times and in bad. So in Oakland County and in, in our Oakland schools, talk about the impact of the fine arts in the K-12 setting and, and how that plays a role in what Oakland schools does as well as in our uh, local school districts. Well, I've been the fine arts consultant at Oakland School since 2004, and I've been advocating for quality fine arts education and facilitating events such as art shows and professional development for the 28 school districts in Oakland County. The fine arts are very important for all students, and I'm so glad you brought it up that often, unfortunately, it's the first thing to go, or they're the first thing to go. Kids need to be able to express themselves creatively and learn to think out of the box, which are traits that all businesses are looking for in their new hires. There's no right or wrong answers in many of the arts as students learn to strengthen problem solving and critical thinking skills. And many times, as you kind of alluded to, we know it's true that the only reason some kids come to school is because of their arts class. We keep kids in school. And by the way, when I talk about the arts, I'm talking about music, band, orchestra, choral, and general music, theater, visual art, and dance, which are subjects that are often taught in Oakland County schools. 
And, and as we talk about funding, or as was mentioned earlier, often uh, this comes from the funding for these programs comes from the school district's general fund. And depending on you know, one year versus the other, or, or uh, you know, uh, certain projections for years forward versus others, that can vary. But to really thrive. Uh, in these programs, they have these programs thrive for the kids. They need to have more generalized community support. So speak to how uh, community members and alumni can get involved in these programs, uh, either by financial backing or by being involved one-to-one -one with these school districts and how much of an impact that has on the quality of fine arts programs. Right, we are funded through the general funds of the school district. Um, however, there are additional funding sources, such as mini grant or traditional grants through the Michigan Arts and Culture Council, um, which are federal funds. However, um, that grant writing process can be difficult and long. And mini grants though, however, for teachers are much more doable. There are also grants available in many districts through educational foundations, PTOs and PTAs. And then I'm sure we've all been approached uh, because many ensembles will utilize fundraisers such as selling candy, popcorn for special trips. Um, and then there's also methods for visual art classes to raise money such as selling student designed um, mugs or household objects through Artsonia, which is an organization online and they have great things to buy and will transfer your students art onto any number of great things. Regarding community support, it's really important that the community supports um, the arts programs or any programs in their local school districts. Alumni or community members can contact a teacher and volunteer their time, share their, exper uh, their experiences or expertise with the kids. Uh, many teachers can use an extra hand with specific projects. Parents can volunteer as chaperones for field trips help with theatrical productions such as selling tickets, organizing dinners, or painting sets. The list is really endless with volunteer opportunities, and I highly recommend volunteering in one's local school district. In addition, by the way, many high schools offer senior citizen discounts to performances, so sometimes seniors um, can't get to Metro Detroit for the symphony or the opera or dance or art exhibits. However, within their very own districts, very close to their homes, there are a wealth of opportunities for them, many free of charge. And, and whether it's those in the community that are giving their time, their support, to these programs, school district by school district, school by school, or it's the staff and the faculty who are often leading these classes and leading these programs, giving more of their time for for uh, uh, additional opportunities like you know jazz band or uh, or, or uh, extra practice opportunities for those that are going into competitions. There's so much that goes into helping these programs catapult themselves to the next level and therefore help the kids in the classroom in these fine arts programs. From the intermediate school district, the Oakland Schools' perspective. How does how does this uh, how's the ISD factor in to supporting these programs district by district? Well, we do um, an, an immense uh, service, I think. By the way, I'm one of many uh, curricular fine arts uh, consultants. I happen to be overseeing the fine arts. Um, Oakland Schools is a fabulous place to um, display art. And thanks to the art teachers, I'm really proud to facilitate monthly student art displays. Um, and it doesn't matter whether you're a parent or a staff here, the art is amazing, very high quality in our schools. Um, this year, I'm proud to host evening open houses of art exhibits 
once per month for those who are unable to come and see their students are during the month, during the regular school day. Um, we're also featuring art right now from Avondale and Rochester. And this week we had 282 visitors see their kids art at the evening open house just the other day. Um, April, we're going to feature art from Huron Valley's K-5 Pontiac and Southfield School Districts. In addition, I, um, through my Fine Arts Advisory Council, uh, plan and facilitate professional development for all of the arts teachers. And, and and so these supports are are really across the board through our, our programs all across the school mm -hmm. districts that are under the Oakland schools umbrella and it has a big impact on our kids. What's also a big part of this, uh, not just the creative opportunities and the, and the team building and the communication building that comes from fine arts is, is the ability to participate in friendly, uh, in friendly but competitive competition. And there's plenty of opportunities for those that are passionate about showcasing their art, whether it is in the theater or it's, uh, in, or it's you know, in painting and drawing or in band and orchestra and so on uh, here in our local area. Can, can you talk about some of those competitive opportunities that are available through Oakland schools and their partnerships with these school districts? Absolutely. Some students and some teachers thrive on competition. Yeah. However, not all. And so going to a middle or high school Michigan School Band and Orchestra Association, which is MSBOA, or Michigan School Vocal Music Association, MSVMA, depends on whether or not the school's music director wants that experience for their students and their students are ready for their experience. Um, there are positives and negatives on both sides of the issue, just like anything else. Um, if a director chooses to go to a district festival, they can do so for ratings or comments only. At the festival, each group prepares two compositions to perform before three adjudicators. They also learn to sight read, which means playing a piece they've never seen before as proficiently as possible. And that's judged as well as timed. If the schools um, and the groups score first division ratings overall, then they are eligible to go to a state festival where the process is the same. It's not an easy situation. Um, School Vocal Music Association has slightly different process than MSBOA. They too have the three concert judges but after and sight reading, but after the performance, one of the judges does a short clinic with the group. So it's truly a learning experience for the ensembles. Uh, many directors hold pre-festival concerts where someone, usually a friend of the director, acts as a judge who shares their comments with the student, which is basically a dress rehearsal. Um, I highly recommend parents attend festivals to experience firsthand what the kids are going through. It's like a championship game. And as well as I hope all parents attend all concerts, no matter what the kids tell you that it's important or it's not important. With visual arts, there are also a gazillion uh, competitions depending on grade levels. The Michigan Art Education Association sponsors competitions where high schoolers can have their art juried and chosen to display at the state capitol in Lansing. Many congressional districts also have art um, competitions and showcase their student art from their district. Oh. Oakland Schools hosted the MAEA Regional Art Show throughout the month of February. We're also partnering right now with the Oakland County Treasurer's Office and Flagstar Bank for the Oakland County Treasurer's Financial Empowerment Arts Contest. The deadline was just last Friday. Oakland County Public High School students who submitted art pieces can win up to $1,000 per grade level for first places. The art show reception will be Thursday, May 11th at Flagstar Bank headquarters in Troy. 
And this is the 12th year of this competition. And we're grateful that each year Flagstar has contributed $10,000 in cash prizes, over 120,000 for our students in the last 12 years. Well, Hattie, we appreciate having you on. We are a little bit uh, behind time here and we do have to wrap things ah. up, but so great to have you on the show hey. and talk about all the great programs in the fine arts in Oakland schools. Thank you. I'm here to help in any way possible. So please, viewers, contact me. Well, Hattie, we appreciate having you on and telling us more about all the great fine arts programs that are available through Oakland schools and, of course, through our local school districts. So much of that support does come from the intermediate school district to make those connections so school districts can get kids involved in the arts all throughout our local communities and, of course, that those local communities can uh, engage in the arts in, in ways that are incredibly fruitful and, and for these kids and their education and really bolster all the great things happening in Oakland schools and in our in our in our uh, individual school districts throughout our local area. Joining us now on the Megacast as we get further along into the warmer seasons of the year, it means it's almost time to say hello once again to our mortal enemies, the mosquitoes, and our good friends, the bees. Yes, they are our friends. The bees are our friends. And joining us now to explain why that is so and more is Brian Peterson Rose, the founder of Bees in the D. Brian, thanks for being with us once again. Hey, Tyler. It's always great to be with you. Yeah, glad to have you on as well. I understand that you're uh, actually not here in Michigan with us, but in another place where you know, bees love to frequent in, uh, in South America. T tell us about that, where you're at. Yeah, so I am actually atop of Sugarloaf, which is in Rio de Janeiro. Oh. And uh, up here on the mountain, they actually have stingless honeybees. And so I am uh, learning more about some of their native bees here through a cool program uh, that we're a part of, uh, the Wiley program, which is part of Global Ties Detroit, and which is also part of the U.S. State Department. And we get to do exchange programs. So we're also heading out tomorrow to Argentina to be with a fellow that we had, Anna, who was in Michigan with us learning about urban beekeeping in Detroit last summer. <laughs> And, and that's just some of the, the different things that you do with Bees in the D, is getting that educational background so you can provide it to people right here in our local area about the bees in Detroit and in the metropolitan area. So tell us, for those that aren't familiar with Bees in the D, tell us about the work that your organization does. So we're a nonprofit out of Detroit. We have about uh, 220 hives across 70 locations in southeast Michigan uh, that goes across about five counties. And we, um, uh, for the last six years, have just the importance of education and conservation of our pollinators. And so we do use honeybees as one of the species to help educate people, but we are uh, really stressing the importance of all of our bees, our native bees and even bees globally. You can find more information about Bees in the D in a couple of different places, either ShareDetroit.org, where they are one of over 330 charities and nonprofits supported on the Share Detroit platform, or by visiting their website at BeesInTheD.com, BeesInTheD.com. Uh, and you're partnered with a lot of organizations all throughout our local area, both here in Oakland County and all across the Metro Detroit. So tell us about those partnerships and how an organization like yours that's really focused on, on bees and on, on beekeeping in our local metropolitan area are able to partner with these different organizations. Well, we're so fortunate to partner with uh, so many different groups. Uh, we're with corporations and businesses where they're helping you know, with our bee populations as part of their sustainability goals. But then we also have a lot of locations uh, in gardens, uh, like urban gardens, uh, especially in Detroit or in farm areas that help with our food agriculture. And then of course, uh, most of you probably know that I am a teacher that's at my heart. And so we have quite a few hives also at school locations so that we can start teaching the next generation about the importance of our pollinators and the, the art of beekeeping. And, and so you have locations also with, with those partnerships all throughout Metro Detroit, not just in the city of Detroit proper, but in some of our suburbs uh, right here in Oakland County as well. Tell us about some of your locations and you know, how that ultimately came to be to have these hives spread all throughout our local area. Yeah, so a lot of the, the, the larger businesses like the car manufacturers and they reached out to us knowing that uh, this is a program that we do. 
Um, but then we've also reached out to a lot of, the, like I said, the schools. So we're up there, like you said, in Oakland County at Rochester um, Montessori School. Um, we're up at Oakland University. We're all the way up into Blake's, where obviously that's a place that we go to get some fresh produce. Uh, so we are scattered around. Youngblood Vineyard is a fun one up there in, up, up in Oakland County uh, area that uh, we have, too, um, where the bees are all throughout the vineyards, which is pretty cool. And especially in uh, downtown Detroit, that's an area where you would, uh, and for, the, for those that don't know much about bees, not really think that, oh, bees are going to be frequenting a major city like this where there's you know maybe not a whole lot of wild areas for them to explore or, or flowers necessarily for them to pollinate and, and ultimately be able to produce their honey back at their hives but uh, that's not necessarily the case so how how prevalent are bees actually in our major cities like detroit i'm so glad you asked that because there's a huge misconception that we would think that the bees uh their populations and their health is stronger in like rural areas or even the suburban areas as people plant a lot of flowers. But actually it's been proven now that they are stronger in the urban environment. And one of the main reasons for that is there is a larger diversity of plant life. And uh, if you think about it, uh, especially in Detroit, all the vacant lots, the urban gardens. Um, and so our bees, what's fun with bees in the D is that we are in many different locations. And we use that data along with hive tracks and best bees. And that data then allows us to check the health of the bees and our urban bees are the strong ones. And they actually even produce more honey than some of our bees out in the rural areas, even though you'd think it'd be the opposite. So you're on the cutting yeah. edge of this. Uh, and you're collecting some of this data, you're understanding some of the data that's behind it. Uh, what sort of evidence is presented there that, make, that, that shows why that might be the case that an urban area would be better for these honeybees to produce their honey than in a suburban area or certainly a rural area. It boils down to that diversity of plant life, which seems so weird about urban. What they can do is they can do a DNA testing of the honey. Um, every jar of honey, um, if it is raw honey, uh, basically has DNA from every flower that those bees went out and foraged on. And when they did test of honey from suburban or from rural, or from the urban area, they were able to ex find out what DNA or what flowers was a part of that. And there was a, a larger diversity in the urban. And it's just like us, we need a diversity of diet as well. And so that uh, helps with their health overall. Out in the rural areas, if you really think about it, it's a lot of mono societies. So it, it, it sometimes is limited to uh, one or two crops, um, but that's what's pretty cool about it. So isn't it dangerous, Brian, to bring all these bees into an urban area or a suburban area where there's all these people and all this yeah. activity? Because everyone's going to get stung, right? Yeah, it's a complete opposite. Um, that, of course, is a lot of people's concern. But um, bees are very di different than our wasps. And we have uh, about 460 different bee species in Michigan alone. And they don't want anything to do with us as humans. They're out foraging, finding the, the flowers. Um, it's more of the wasp and the hornets that tend to be a little bit more um, uh, defensive is the word I like to use. Now, of course, with honeybees or any bees, if you're batting at them or swatting at them or, or bothering their homes, of course, they're going to be a little concerned and, and want to defend it. But no, uh, we've been in the city now for six years and they have no issues whatsoever. Brian Peterson Roast is the founder of Bees in the D and joins us on today's edition of the Megacast. They're also one of over 300 charities and nonprofits supported on the Shared Detroit platform. You can find more information about Bees in the D and organizations like it and organizations in a variety of, of other subject areas and areas of support throughout the Metro Detroit area by visiting shareddetroit.org. Just click into their Find a Nonprofit section and search for whatever warms your heart or is an important issue to you or search directly for Bees in the D to find more information about ways you can get involved with this organization right here in Oakland County and across the state of Michigan. And let's dive into some of those different ways, Brian, because people can get involved in this organization beyond just engaging with it for educational purposes. They can actually get involved with some of these hives in their local area, too. Yeah, um, so we, we have a large uh, volunteer base, and, and what's great is the volunteers have many different skills. Like you said, some of them might want to help with the education or even um you know when we sit at tables to share about the importance but then we have a lot of volunteers that will come in 
and help with the honey harvest. Um, and then, of course, beekeeping. But it is a, um, it, it's not something that you learn overnight. Uh, I usually tell people, give it at least a year and join some bee clubs. Um, take some classes. If you can get a mentor, great. Um, because uh, the beekeeping, you've got hundreds of thousands of lives that, that you are helping to manage and keep them healthy. And so you want to make sure that you understand how to do that properly. So we do train people to help us manage some of the hives throughout Metro Detroit as well. Brian Peterson Roast is the founder of Bees in the D and joins us on today's edition of the Megacast. You can find more ways to get involved as well as some of Bees in the D's products made right here in the Metro Detroit area at beesinthed.com. Beesinthed.com or visit them also at sharedetroit.com. Uh, ShareDetroit.org for more information about them as well as over 300 other charities and nonprofits across our local area, including right here in Oakland County. And, and Brian, we've been talking to you here at our flagship at Civic Center TV for a number of years since you were just starting this organization as it's continued to grow and expand and become a staple among non amongst nonprofits in not just Oakland County, but in metropolitan Detroit. Where did this all begin for you as the founder of this organization to put this mission forward and, and ultimately to action and expand to where it's at now? Well, I shared that I'm a teacher and I was given the opportunity uh, from the Rochester Garden Club to uh, take a two week course up on Beaver Island, at the biological center to learn beekeeping. And one of the asks was, as long as you bring back some of the knowledge that you learn about the bees to the classroom. Well, of course I did that. Uh, my, my kids, uh, I, I teach fourth and fifth graders. Uh, they, they hear about bees quite often. Uh, but then that just uh, snowballed into learning more about these bees and the, the parasites and the problems that they have. And I just wanted to help in our little corner uh, of Metro Detroit area. And so we started the nonprofit and uh, so really, it all started from the generosity of others. And there's plenty of ways to get involved with Bees in the D directly, as you mentioned, those volunteer opportunities, but also at a number of different local events all throughout the Metro Detroit area, because that's where those hives are. That's where they do all these different activities to support our local bees and, of course, to uh, develop some of that great Detroit made honey, Michigan made honey that they, that they provide all throughout the state of Michigan. So if people want to get involved, what are some upcoming events that they will be able to visit bees in the D at? Well, we've got um, a honey pairing coming up that we do with bee nectar. That's always fun. And we uh, brought back the Girl Scout patch for beekeeping. And so through the Girl Scouts of Southeast Michigan, we have quite a few hive tours where they can earn that patch. Um, and then we're gonna be having a lot more events coming up because it's becoming bee season. Um, and you can find those on our webpage under events at beesinthed.com. Yeah, those Girl Scout hive tours, May 19th through July 15th. So all summer long, you'll be able to get uh, your girls involved and learn more about the bees. And of course, get that beekeeping badge for those Girl Scouts. And more information on all of Bees in the D's events can be found at beesinthed.com slash events. You can also find a number of different opportunities, including places you can get some of the Bees in the D pro uh, products, such as that honey. Brian, tell us about some of those locations while we have a few more minutes with you that people may be, may be able to get some of these products and support your mission in the process. Yeah, we're super excited that we've been expanding through the Meyer marketplaces. They just opened up two new stores, one up in Lake Orion, one up in Macomb County. And of course, there's the one that's been um, over by Beaumont. And uh, I think that's in Royal Oak. And then, of course, the new one, uh, it's fairly new, down in Detroit on Jefferson. So uh, we have our honey products there. Um, and of course you can always get our honey online and then we uh, sell our honey at most of the events that we do. Our library uh, things, the Lavender Festival up at uh, Blake's, uh, so different events as well. Yeah, tours, books, events, products such as honey, lip balm, uh, and, and collaborative products with other groups, organizations, and businesses all throughout our local area. Beesinthed.com for more information on all of that. Brian Peterson Roast is the founder of Bees in the D and joins us on today's edition of the Megacast. Brian, another 90 seconds or so before we'll need to wrap things up today. What are, what are some lasting things that you wish people knew about honeybees that we either haven't discussed or that are common other misconceptions that people have about the honeybee? Well, the one that I talked about a little bit was the, the wasp and the bees that they're, that, uh, you know, they, they kind of get plump, like, popped in one category, like bees. Um, most of the ones you see when you're at the zoo around the trash cans or things like that, those are wasps. 
um, and not bees at all. And the other huge misconception I kind of hinted at too was honeybees aren't the only bees. There's 460 species in Michigan, about 4,000 in the United States and 20,000 worldwide. That's why we're so excited to be here to learn about them here in uh, Rio de Janeiro. And it's a global thing. Uh, the bee populations are dropping across the globe. And so it's very important for us to understand and, and help because they also are an indicator species that lets us know when maybe some things aren't going so great with our environment. You can find more information and get in contact with Bees in D, join them on their events, get involved as a volunteer and more at beesinthed.com. Follow them also on social media and keep up the, the date on everything that they're doing here in the Oakland County area and in Metro Detroit, all throughout Michigan and around the world also uh, at Bees in the D on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. Brian, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And you know, I love being with you here, Tyler. And I just want to thank everybody that has supported us because as a nonprofit, we do depend on those donations and those sales. Everything goes back to furthering it or our events where you get to learn, but also are helping to support our mission. So thank you. That indeed. Beesinthed.com is the place to go for more information or visit them on sharedetroit.org. We can also visit over 330 other charities and nonprofits across our local area and support so many good causes and so many good efforts happening right here in our local area. That is going to do it for today's edition of the Megacast. As always, you can keep up to date with us and find us on demand on civiccentertv.com slash megacast. Big thank you to each and every one of our guests for joining us as well as solo Calvin Brown at Master Control, our director today, uh, pushing all the buttons, keeping us on the air and keeping things moving along. Until next time, take care of each other and we'll see you very soon.